Hello church family, glad to be with you. I just want to communicate a few things before the message uh, this week. I, I hope that uh, you are doing well, uh, both physically and spiritually. Uh, we continue to pray, as uh, Pastor and I um, we continue to get together and we, we pray uh, for the flock. And so that's one of our, our biggest concerns for you, is that uh, you might be healthy physically and spiritually during this time. If you did not receive an email this past Thursday night from me, uh, let me know. Uh, I know some people uh, watch this through YouTube or through Facebook and are part of this church family and may not be receiving email updates. And so if you're one of those people, please uh, give me your email address and I will make sure that the email is sent out to you. But I sent an email regarding church reopening. Um, we don't know when that is, uh, but we're preparing for it. We're praying and, and prepping. And so one of the questions in the email is, uh, when CBC reopens, will you attend um, the first week that it's open? Or will you wait a you know, certain period of time uh, before you come back? And we realize there's various reasons for that. Those are all acceptable in the email. I lay that out. And so... Uh, don't worry about the reasoning. What we're trying to do is plan because one of the, the talks is that 25% of capacity, which for us here at the church would be about 70 people, um, we could have service. That's one of the first possible options. Again, there's many options, many things going around, but we're trying to understand how many people would come so that we would either hold one or two services uh, depending on how many people would show up when we are first allowed to reopen. And so uh, if you didn't get the email, email me, brucehavens at gmail.com or our church, cbcbrewerton at gmail.com or Pastor Andy, Andy Kajlak, gmail.com at gmail.com and we will then uh, figure out what, how many people will be attending and we'll let you know with all the details. Again, we'll do all the things that they're telling us to do, uh, social distancing, wearing masks and things like that when we reopen, but uh, we're trying to prepare for that. We don't know if that's a week from now, a month from now, or months from now. Uh, we hope that it's sooner than later, but just wanted to get that information out to you. Let me pray before we get into God's Word here this morning. Father, we thank you for this time that we can uh, hear from you. Uh, your Word is truth. You, you have made sure of that. You guaranteed that when you used your Spirit uh, in your apostles to record uh, scriptures for us. And so what we have in our hands today is from you. You have preserved it over the years. And we're thankful for that. I pray that each and every one of us would regularly be in your word so that we might know you more. Lord, these are interesting times that we live in. And I pray that uh, for some of us, um, there may be some despair. You, on the other hand, have brought hope through your son, Jesus Christ. And so I pray this day and every day that each and every one of us will be reminded of the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. And so we thank you uh, for your son. We're th we thank you for his sacrifice. And, and we are thankful uh, that for those who've accepted him as Savior, that we are now living in Christ. We've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. You've made us a new creation in Christ. And so, Lord, our, our prayer is very simple. May we live in the way that you've created us. May we continue to put off the old man and put on the new man. Not just in our status, you've done that for us, but in our practical everyday living. And we'll give you the glory for it. And we'll praise you for it. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we live in an amazing world. Beauty is all around us. Uh, recently, last night, I guess it's a little bit, a few years ago now, we were at Niagara Falls, my family and I, and just the beauty of Niagara Falls was, uh, was amazing. It's impressive to think about of 
water, the gallons of water that are going over the falls uh, each and every day. But there's beauty all around us in our creation. Another one I just picked for you was the Grand Canyon. Uh, the beauty of of creation is amazing. We could go and, and talk about so many other things, but we live in an amazing world. What about architectural features? Uh, man, architectural feats that continue to stand. I mean, the Roman Colosseum was built 2,000 years ago, and yes, it's lost some of it, but it's still standing. <laughs> the Tower of Pisa, it's, it's still standing. <laughs> It's amazing that it's still standing, but as of this date, it, it's still standing, and so it's an amazing thing. Medical science just keeps advancing. These glasses that are they're, they're creating are for the hearing impaired, and there's a camera on there that sees and then turns that into audio so that as the person looks around who, who uh, cannot see, can hear what they're seeing. And so, I don't know about you, but there's just so many things in this world that are amazing. But what impresses you? What stops and, and grabs your attention? Being impressed is something that causes you to feel admiration or respect. It's something or someone that causes you to understand its importance or value. For a mother of a toddler, well, it might be a child making his bed. I mean, you think about how a child can understand their responsibilities and taking care of the things that they have. Maybe it's picking up their toys. Yes, parents, we need to do creative ways, right? And helping our children want to be able to pick up their toys. And so this truck here is in a creative way that we can help our children want to pick up our toys. But maybe you're not a mother of a toddler. Maybe you're a mother of a teenager. And so it may, again, be helping them, it's them making their bed, or them picking up their room. Oh, that's right, I couldn't find any pictures of teenagers making their bed or picking up their clothes. But seriously, what should be so impressive in this world that is more than just one mother's impression, you know, being impressed by it, but it's thousands and millions of people who stop and take notice. What should be that impressive to all of mankind that people are not so impressed by these days? My answer is the church. The church should be the most impressive entity known to mankind. Now I know what you're thinking. You're like, Man, you're a pastor. You're biased. You should think that the church should be the most impressive thing. Or maybe you're saying, yes, I'm a devoted church member, and I believe that the church should be the most impressive thing. And you're saying, we're biased. And so maybe the question should be more like, shouldn't the church be the most impressive entity in the world? When our missions team uh, went over the check a few years ago, we visited an impressive church in Prague. The architecture was amazing. I mean, standing outside of it and looking up at it, it was just expanse. I mean, it was just building, and it just, it, it just brought your eyes vertical to the heavens. That was the goal of architecture back then. They wanted people, when they stepped inside a church or they came up to a church, that their eyes would be vertical. That when they were inside the building, it was so massive, right? that no one ever felt claustrophobic. Everything just was immense. It was huge. The space was just grandeur. And you said, wow, that's who God is. People who had built churches like this at that time period had a high view of God. Now, I know what you're saying. I know what you're thinking. As cool as this is, they had, the, they had their eyes on the wrong thing, didn't they? Because the church is not its building, but its people. The focus should be on the people of God. And that's why we should be so impressive. When God's people, when God's children act and live in the way that they've been created in the new man, and when they gather together, 
And as a group, collectively, they live like Christ lived in their community, that should be impressive. That should make people stop and reflect. They might, that should make them think about, wow, that has value to it. That has importance to it. That's something that's missing in my life. Churches who are God's people should be the most impressive entity in this world. Now you may notice that I said should. There was a time, even in, in this country, where the community listened to the church. Whether that was through the pastor who spoke for it, or the group as a whole. Churches used to be the center of town. But now they're on the outskirts, both physically and spiritually. And unfortunately, if you see a church that's still in the downtown area of community, it's usually not too impressive, is it? The grass is not cut. The building structure is, is crumbling. And so again, people are not very impressed with the church physically, the church spiritually, and how they are a changing impact, a changing influence for good in their community. And they're not too impressed with God. I'll say it again. Churches should be the most impressive entity in this world. Again, God's people, when, it, when, when they do what God has called them to do, when they love one another, when they love their neighbor, then people will see and have a sense of value. They will, they will know, they will see the importance of it. But unfortunately, the churches today are no different from the world that they live in. The cultural issues that are outside the church are the same that are inside the church. The same that are with the people and the culture are with the people and the culture of the church. And so Paul explains to the church at Ephesus how it should be built so that it will be the most impressive entity for people to see. This morning we're going to look at church unity Building God's temple. Please open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll be looking at verses 19 through 22 this morning. Of course, I'm going to start back at verse 11 because that's where the section really kicked in and we picked up on last week. And so I'll start at verse 11 and read through verse 22. Church unity. Building God's temple. Therefore, remember that formerly you, the Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by the so-called circumcision that is performed on the body by human hands, that you were at that time without the Messiah, alienated from the citizenship of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, Christ, or excuse me, but now in Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, the one who made both groups into one and who destroyed the middle wall of partition, the hostility, when he nullified in his flesh the law, the commandments, and decrees. He did this to create in himself one new man out of two, thus making peace, and to reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by which the hostility has been killed. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near, so that through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then, you who are no longer foreigners and non-citizens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, because you have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as a cornerstone, in him, the whole building, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into the dwelling place of God in the Spirit. And so when we look at our text today, we're going to see how God does a wonderful thing in uniting the church. This isn't just so that there could be peace 
and reconciliation inside the church and with Him, but it's to be a shining example to all those who are around them. To let everybody know that God is exalted. That anyone who encounters this holy God should come away impressed by seeing the value and importance of God. And so we look at the first uh, verse 19. Gentiles, you are equally a part of God's household. Gentiles, you are equally a part of God's household. So it starts with, so then. Paul's making a summary statement here of verses 11 through 18. He's not just recapping the concept in verse 19, however. He's calling the people to live in unity. First, he's telling them that they are, that they've been brought together in unity, and now he's declaring their new unified status. And so he's not just giving them an intellectual fact, but he's telling them how they should live. They should live in unity. Gentiles are no longer foreigners and non citizens. These words are, are so closely related that Paul's just using a literary restatement here. But if there is some distinction between the two, I believe it's this. A foreigner was someone who was passing through the town. They were not one who was going to stay there uh, for several years. While well, a non-citizen lived there and possibly was even born there, but they did not have the status of Jew. And so for them, there was no protection. There are no privileges for them. But later in Ephesians... Paul addresses uh, not just Gentiles as a whole, but he starts going into other groups like women and slaves. Both of these groups had a different status level before Christ, like the Gentiles. You know, it's, it's so many years later, and it still really is not that much different. It's not too difficult for us to understand this concept in our culture today. We see the race issues that still exist today. It saddens us. It should bring us to tears. We understand that we still have gender issues today. Women doing the same jobs as men are not being paid the same wage as a man does. The church, if it wants to be impressive to all those around, the church is to be different than the culture in which we live in. Before Christ, there's no equal status. And now, in our new creation, in the new man that we learned about last week, there is. The Gentiles are now fellow citizens. Equal status, equal protection, equal rights. When we think about all that these fellow Gentiles, what all that encounters and what it entails, people need to understand it correctly or they'll misapply what it means. When we are equal in status, there's a difference from then having an equal uh, responsibility and function. Status and function are not the same. And so when we come to thinking about status, yes, we are all equal and we're all valuable, needed. But when it comes to function, there still are different functions inside the church, inside life as a whole. Isn't that what Paul addressed in 1 Corinthians 12? by using the body analogy. People of the church are equally valuable and placed in one body. But the body has different functions. There's hands, there's feet, there's elbows, and so forth. Remove one of its members and the body is hindered. The church is hindered. But they don't all do the same function. Hands are different from feet. And so Paul continues this discussion of what fellow citizens are. We need to understand that they are equal in status. That they're all valuable before God. They're all valuable in the body. We need to break down these barriers, 
not the differences in function. We need everybody on the team doing their part. We need everybody in the body doing their part so that it will impress those who are around us. Paul is emphasizing that all people who are in Christ have the same status. And so let's dig down a little bit deeper on that. God is the Father to them all. Every single one of them. There's, there's none that have a different Father. They all have the same Father in it being God. And what does God do for His children? Well, He protects them. All of them. Every one of them is protected by a just God. Isn't that amazing? No one is pushed off to the side. No one is left over in a corner. Everyone is protected by God. That means that God provides for them all. I, recently, a friend of ours had a litter of puppies. And it's been amazing watching these puppies uh, feed on the mother and how there's eight of them and they're all moving around and they're thinking, how will they each be provided for? And yet the mother makes sure that each of the, and every one of the puppies is provided for. If a dog can do this, how much more so a holy God who cares for his children way more than this mother does for her puppies. See, that's what happens when we have an equal status. That he's the father to them all. He's the protector. He's the provider. That God is with them all. And at the very essence, God loves them all. So the question then is, what does it look like to live as a citizen and a family member of God's household? I don't know how your family runs, but in my family, we talk about doing your part. Everyone in this family has responsibilities. Yes, as, as far as, as me being uh, the father, I'm going to protect, I'm going to provide, I'm going to love, I'm going to do all those things. But in return, being in the household means that I have responsibilities as a family member. You must carry your weight, is how we say it. Or in football, they like to say, you just do your job. You must do your job. And so with protection and privileges come responsibilities, or some people just call them good old-fashioned chores, right? Listen how Peter explains it in 1 Peter 2, 9 through 11. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. There we are. One status, right? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who has called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are a pe the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Look at Peter replies in verse 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts, which wage war against the soul. You see, citizens and members identify one portion of the two-way street, while saints and household identify the other portion of this. Yes, this is your status. Yes, you are valuable. You have received something. But you know what? It's not just about you and being an individual. You have been brought into something larger. You are one, but, but a part of the whole. And so God is adding you into something, and so you shouldn't come in there with pride, but humility. Thankfulness that you are a part of something larger that God is doing and building His holy temple. And so as you think about your salvation, you belong to something bigger. You belong to a community. There's no independency in God's household. There's no individually individuality amongst the saints. And so let's talk about what it means to be a saint. The text says, with the saints. When I think saint, I think holy and separated for God's purposes. Holy and separated for God's purposes. You've heard it elsewhere by Paul where he says, you are not your own. 
You were bought with a price. And so realize that you are a part of something bigger. And so what exactly does this mean? What is this something larger? Again, we're saying the saints with the saints. Gentiles and fellow citizens with the saints. And so who are the saints? Well, I'll give you one answer, but they're not. It's not the New Orleans saints, right? It's not the football team. Various scholars have debated this group, and then, you know, here's the four that they come up with. Was it Israel? Maybe it's Jewish Christians. Or it could be all believers. And lastly, angels. Now, Israel can be ruled out pretty easily. This whole text here, this whole section of this text is discussing about what it means to be in Christ. And so we understand that there's people that are in Christ, and we understand that there's people that are not in Christ. And we know that all of Israel was not saved. Wasn't it Israel's religious leaders who put Christ to death? And so we can get rid of number one pretty easily. And as I think about possibilities two through four, well, we have to go back to understanding how this fits in with verses 11 through 13, and verses 20 to 22 that we'll be looking at in a moment. And he's saying in these verses that there are no distinctions. And so it, it could just be Jewish Christians, but he's talking to a larger group. Now, you can't see it in the English, but in the Greek, there's a word connection that Paul employs here. All the words that I'm going to give to you derive from the same root. There's foreigners, non-citizens, and members of household. All have the same root that Paul is doing a word play off of here. But then he continues on in verses 20 through 22 where he goes, built on, building, and built together. Again, all the same root word, but then there's different prefixes or suffixes on them that then change the meaning slightly. But Paul is trying to show you how there are many things that are being brought together into this larger group. And so for me, the second option is out because it limits, not makes it available to more. That leaves options three and four. And both of these make sense as we read through verse 22. When Paul talks about the holy temple being built, he has a bigger picture in mind. Even throughout the letter to the Ephesians, he uses this term saints uh, a few more times. And each time that he uses it, he's referring to believers in general. And so option three makes sense. It could be all believers. But if we were to expand our thinking, because so, so many times we think just in this temporal world. But what about the bigger picture yet? Uh, we understand that when we think about heaven, that we know that it won't just be people worshiping God, but there will be angels worshiping God as well. And so Paul could be using this term, saints or holy ones, as describing angels. He does this twice, or he does this in both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. This is also seen in the Old Testament, or three places. It's once in Job and twice in Psalm 89. And so Paul's teaching here about this, with the saints could mean that we're not just talking about those who are on earth, but in heaven. The writer of Hebrews talks about people and angels coming together on Mount Zion in the heavenly Jerusalem for a festal gathering. It's just so cool. And so... I'm open to the, this interpretation of with the saints, either being all believers, or it, it could be all believers with the angels as we look at God's bigger picture. Again, we become so myoptic in our thinking about salvation. We think about me, myself, and I. Thankfully, I'm saved. And it's all this inner reflective individuality versus thinking about the community the church of God in this locale, the church of God around this globe. But what about God's bigger building project that includes the angels? What a day it's going to be when all of God's building gathers around him to exalt his name. You want to talk about impressive. 
gives me goosebumps thinking about how impressive that will be, that I'll be standing around in the sea of people and angels worshiping a holy God. And so don't have a myopic view about your salvation. Yes, your status has been changed. Yes, Gentiles are fellow citizens with Israel. Right? But it's not with Israel in which they were incorporated into Israel. There's something larger going on here. And so don't be self-centered when you think about God's building project because that stops the building process. But have an open mind to be looking around so that you might help other people see who God is so that if God saves them and transforms them and places them into his household, that then you will continue to see his household being built for his glory. Christ removed all distinctions of status so that the diversity of functions could grow in God's household intimately together into something much, much larger. Let's look at this, this building that he's building in verses 20 through 22. God is building his residence by uniting fellow citizens together. God is building his residence by uniting fellow citizens together. Let me just read this for you. Because you have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. You know that God is omnipresent. Yes, He is everywhere. But there's a special sense in which God dwells in His holy temple. The Jews experienced a little bit of this with the Shekinah. Right? Whether it was when they were coming and they had their camp, and in the middle of the camp they had their, their uh, holy of holies that was set up there, or when they came to the building project that was completed in Israel and they had the temple there, they understood just a little bit of His Shekinah glory, the manifestation of God dwelling with His people. But now, Paul says the church is His temple. Previously, the presence of God resided in a place. And now, the presence of God resides with His people. The church is not a building. We're very familiar with this concept. But it's God's people gathered together. That's why we call this here, this video recording, uh, when you watch it in your house, that's why I don't call it church. Because God's local assembly is not gathered together in one place to worship God. And that's what we long for. That's why we long for the meeting again of His people together. That's what the church is. And so even though Paul does not use the word church in these verses, he's already established this both prior to our, our section and after. Let me show you. Prior to, it's Ephesians 1, verses 22 and 23. And God put all things under Christ's feet, and He gave Him to the church as head over all things. Now, the church is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. And so this, this item that's being built, this holy temple that is being built, is in Christ. After our section, we see it in Ephesians 3.10. The purpose of this enlightenment is that through the church, the multifaceted wisdom of God should now be disclosed. Previously, it wasn't disclosed. The mystery was, was now revealed in Paul through Christ. Paul by telling them, but in Christ, the actual person who brought this mystery to be known. God's plan is now disclosed in Christ. And so we're so thankful that the mystery is revealed. And that mystery is that God is building something much larger, much bigger than Israel. Maybe even much bigger than just this world. When we think about the angels being brought in together with it. And so for us to start thinking about it, 
we need to understand that huge does not even begin to describe it. As beautiful and as wonderful as the Old Testament temple was, God had something else in mind here. And it takes both Jews and Gentiles being brought together to make it. This is the holy temple where God dwells. So let's look at this building project. Paul is helping us to understand what this building project looks like. Understand that the people are not the ones who are building it. But it's God who's building it himself. People are part of the process, but we're not doing the building. God is the one that's doing the work. And so, so since we're talking about building projects, it can be easily remembered by foundation, verse 20, formation, verse 21, and function, verse 22. Foundation, formation, and function. Verse 20 describes the foundation. You have been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Paul is talking about the church. You here is no longer just Gentiles. Before, when Paul was using you, he was talking about just Gentiles, but now we understand that Gentiles and Jews. When he says you, it's connecting it back to what? Fellow citizens. And so he's, Paul is talking in the you here as being fellow citizens. As the fellow citizens that heard the apostles and prophets. Apostles refers to the twelve disciples and Paul along with James. And perhaps Barnabas. You can see the verses there. I listed them for you. And you can uh, read those later in the day. But they had seen the risen Lord. That was one of the, the, one of the conditions in becoming an apostle. That they had seen the risen Lord, Jesus. But there's, this is probably the more important one. And he, being Jesus, commissioned them with special authority to the, to the founding of the church. See, when a person has to say, I'm an apostle, there's a problem with it. But when God says, he is an apostle, then we listen to it. We say, full authority has been given by God to that person. And so there's no self-proclamation in being an apostle. There's no self-proclamation in what will be becoming a prophet. When people want to self-proclaim that they're an apostle or a prophet, there's a problem. Because it is God who has placed these folks, apostles, prophets, into the church. Again, we're going to get to that in Ephesians chapter 4. But I just want you to think about that now. In thinking about the apostles, God commissioned them. Christ commissioned them. Notice the word order here. First he writes apostles, then prophets. And you kind of think, well, why wouldn't prophets be first and then apostles? Because prophets came before apostles. Well, that would be if you're thinking that these prophets are the same as the Old Testament prophets, which they're not. There's New Testament prophets. And so he, Paul did this so that there would not be a confusion with them. Old Testament prophets were, were to the Jews. But New Testament prophets are for the fellow citizens. And so that's what he does here. Again, you can see New Testament prophets, again, in verses uh, chapter 3, verse 5, and you'll see it in chapter 4, verse 11. Before the New Testament was completed, the prophets received direct revelation from God to build up and encourage his church. Look at Acts 15, 32. You can look at 1 Corinthians 14, 3, and also uh, verses 29 and 32 of chapter 14. Again, you can look at those later today. I have it on the screen for you. And we can have a good, long discussion, a healthy discussion, on whether New Testament prophets exist today, and if so, what their function is. It's a good question. And it's a question that we're going to answer when we get to chapter 4. But this morning, we're just understanding that's what the foundation is built upon. Some people, you know, believe that the that prophets have ceased with the completion of the Bible. Some people believe that the, uh, the office of prophet uh, has ceased. But the function of prophet has continued. And so, just trying to whet your appetite a little bit for this discussion. Because it's not just a simple little thing that we can just write off so easily. We need to dig into the text. And so again, we'll address this more in detail 
when we get to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, because we understand that Christ gave these apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers to the church. And so it is an important topic to discuss. But right now, understand that they are part of the foundation, but Christ is the cornerstone of that foundation. Without Christ, everything else falters. If you don't set that cornerstone of Christ first, then the foundation of the apostles and prophets after it will falter. It will crumble. It will not stand the test of time. It will not stand the storms of culture and controversy. So praise God that Christ is the cornerstone. I hope you either sang that before this message or you'll sing this after that message, but in the email sent out to you, Christ Our Cornerstone is one of the songs that was selected for this week. I pray that you would spend much time in thinking about Christ being the cornerstone. Really, Paul has already been working through that in Ephesians 1 and 2 for us and how explain how Christ is the cornerstone. A church is not a church. Hear me now. A church is not a church if Christ is not the cornerstone that holds everything together. As well, a church is not a church without the proclamation of God's truth. That's what the apostles and prophets did. They were there. Their job was to communicate God's truth, God's revealed truth to people. Specifically when you talk about the church, the saints, to his people. So that we might know God more intimately. And so a church is not a church that first does not have Christ as a cornerstone. And a church is not a church, secondly, when God's truth, authoritative truth, is not proclaimed in it. That is the foundation that Paul describes in verse 20. And now we're going to see in verse 21 the formation. Verse 21 describes the formation. Fellow, fellow citizens are being joined together that grows into a holy temple. Again, look at the primacy of Christ. In Him. And then later it says, in whom? Without Christ, it all falters. But here the formation aspect of it is that if you are not in union with Christ, if you do not have unity with Christ, you cannot be fit together. It starts with being in Christ that then allows you to be moldable and adjustable and so that you can be fit together with the corresponding parts that are around you. Union in Christ is necessary to grow. That's why I find the church so amazing. When I see how God brings this person and this person and this person into the church, and I see how he starts fitting them together so that they can be so that they can work together. Isn't that what happens in a wall? When you put up studs and you put up drywall and you start building the structure for it. They all work together. You know, even when you make these arches, there's a there's a critical component when you put that last piece in that holds that whole, that whole structure together. Without one of those being fitted together, that structure falls apart. The whole arch drops down. Likewise in a local church. If you think that one person can do all the work that's needed so that this community might be impressed by the local church, you got it all wrong. What impresses people in the community is when you see the body coming together and working together. And when we work together, we come in humility because you can't work together when you have pride. It's humility. And that's what we're talking about when God and Christ fits us together. That each and every one of us has humility as a characteristic in us so that we can be joined together with those working along our side so that we might accomplish much for his kingdom. Ecclesiastes tells us where two or three uh, uh, strands are woven together, it, it creates such a stronger bond. That's how it is for the church. So my question to you today is, do you have the humility that it takes to work with others in the church because Christ is first working in you? 
Think about how they will work together. They're fitted together, and then they work together. They work together in worship. And that's why I long to be with all of you, so that when we come on a Sunday morning and we gather together, that worship is not just music, right? But it's praying, it's reading God's Word, it's singing, it's giving, it's serving. Right? All those together, that's worship. What you do every day, that's worship. But corporate worship, when we come together, man, it's a beautiful thing when you hear all God's people. When you see all God's people coming together, not for their work, but for something that's bigger and larger. I don't come to church to be a consumer. Working together is also proclaiming Christ. Working together is, is, the, is also standing firm and withstanding the attacks of the evil one. That's what Christ is forming together. Lastly, we see the function. Verse 22 describes the function. Fellow citizens are being built together into a dwelling place. Just, less, just like last week, we see the Trinity at work again. In whom references back to Christ. The dwelling place is for God the Father. Uh, certainly, uh, he, uses, he uses God, which can be uh, you know, all three of them. But most generally speaking, it's, it's defining the Father. And lastly, this is accomplished through the Holy Spirit. So we see the Trinity at work again here in verse 22, just like we saw in, in work in verse 18. The church is not built for an individual. I've already alluded to this, but let me just go in a little bit deeper. Anyone who looks at the church for what it can do for them, whether this is individually, personally, or whether this is for my family, it's one of the things I hear too often. Well, do you have a children's program? Do you have a teenage, you know, do you have a youth program? Or do you have this? Or do you have, what are they doing? They're, le they're raising the level, right, of primacy regarding what the church can do for them versus what they can do. How can they be fitted in together? How can they work together with what God is doing in that church already? People who live this way and think this way hop from church to church and they do not understand God's church. The church is for God. It's not for me. When I come in here and I start going, what can this place do for me? I have it all wrong. I don't understand God's church. The church is not for me. The church is for God. It's His dwelling place. Both of me individually and us Corporately, it is his dwelling place. A church that is full of people who are looking out for their own interests is not holy. It's, not, it's common. It's defiled. And God is not present in that. However, if Christ is the reasoning behind those who are coming to gather together, if it's Christ who is leading the way, demonstrating the way. Well, how did he do that? He left the comforts of being by his Father. He came to earth. He was beaten and bruised, sacrificed and bloodied on our behalf so that it could be something bigger. Christ didn't just say, just you and me, Dad, and, and the Holy Spirit, and these angels who are not fallen. But he came so that people might be redeemed, so that their status might be changed, so that they could be part of this bigger building. And so if Christ had that mindset, shouldn't we also have that mindset? That it shouldn't be only about my own interests, but it should be about the interests of others as well. And first, that interest is of God. The church is about God and His dwelling place. And so if we're going to do that, if we're going to live like Christ, if we're going to sacrifice our life for the church, we need to have a different vision for the church. We need to understand what the church is. We need to 
do that by thinking differently. We need to understand that the church is, is God's. The church is, is God's people, not a building. And the church is God's dwelling place. I, when, when I consider that I will be one of billions and billions of people and angels around the throne of God, how can I sit there and think myoptically? How can I, I sit there and think self-centeredly? Well, this church doesn't have this for me. Or this church doesn't, you know. And we can pick all the divisions that we talked about last week that Christ removed. All the hostility that has been removed. And we can bring up each one of those and say, well, I have rights, and I have concerns, and I have all these things. And God would say, what are you talking about? Do you even know what the church is? It's my dwelling place. Where I reside. This isn't about you. We should be thankful. We should be thankful that God has brought us in to His household and that He has changed our status. And so we need to start thinking correctly about the church. We need to understand what it is and what it is not. And when people do that, in one locale, when people do that in a local church, you start to see the effects of that. When people come into that church building, they'll go, man, this is different. I can see the importance of the church. I, I wasn't sure why I should come to church. I, I can't understand what, what's the benefits of the church. But now, as I look around and I see all you folks all on one page, and I see you guys all loving God and loving neighbor, I, I see the importance of it now. I see the value of it now. Before, I was a fool. And now... I, my eyes are opened. And so that's what we should want here. That's what we should want as we then go into this community. We want it to be impressive. And so no, we might not spend all, the, all of our money on making the building look as fabulous as possible and having those high vaulted ceilings like they, they did in the Czech Republic and they did way back you know, 500 years ago. But nonetheless, we still should want a building that shows how much we love God. And so we should care for it. We should clean it. We should make it uh, as, as useful and effective as possible for the goal, right, of not just impressing them with a physical building, but with the spiritual people who reside in it, who worship in it. And as we go out into the community, that they should say, man, that's impressive as I see that church as a group doing that for this community. What? And they're doing it for free? What? And they're sacrificing their own time for it? That's what becomes impressive. And so how do we do this? We have to harmonize. We have to listen to the person next to me. We have to sing on tune. That takes humility, right? When you think about harmonizing, you think that it's not an individual, but you think it's a group. Right? It's a group going after a common goal. And so that's what we have to do, is we have to work together here. And that starts with humility. Harmonizing does not happen without humility. When we do that, we're going to see God's presence in our own life, and we're going to see God's presence in this local church. This is what's worth living for. This is a, is a unified purpose that we should have. This is a goal that has become to worship God, the one true God, that everyone would be impressed by Him. Starting in the, the grassroots with his people and then working all the way up to him as we work together for his glory. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time in which we can worship you. We thank you for this, this time in which we can hear about your church. Father, forgive us for times when we've misunderstood the church. When we, when we think that the church was about us. 
what I think is best for it instead of what Christ has established and pronounced. And so, Father, help us to understand your greater plan. Help us to come with humility, with thankfulness. If we want to impress others, it first starts, it first starts with us being impressed by you. Father, forgive us for when we have such a low opinion of you. Forgive us when we don't value you as we ought to value you. We value so many more things that are temporal in this world that are temporal uh, in this world that are fading away. Forgive us. Help our lives to be about you and your glory. May we demonstrate that in our lives. Father, as we continue to learn in the book of Ephesians about who you are, the glorious salvation that, that you've given to us, this is all foundational thing, thinking and understanding so that we can then work together. And so we look forward to you continue to teach us through the book of Ephesians so that we might be a church that does not leave its first love. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So because of God's word then, uh, our next steps for today, I, I need to become a member of God's church. Now, certainly what that means is that you don't get this new creation, you don't get this new status unless you first trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And so we talked about that in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Uh, that it's by grace through faith that you are saved, not of yourself. That's right. It's a, it's a gift of God. That's not by works so that anyone should boast. And so we need to understand what Christ's death on the cross has accomplished for us. It's transferred for those who believe, right, who trust in that. It's transferred to them from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. And so I need to become a member of God's church. But... I also need to join a local church. And that's the, the two-way street that I was talking about earlier. Is that It's not just that my status has been changed, right? That's what God's done for me. But being a citizen or being a member of a household, it means that I have certain responsibilities. And so I, I know uh, that we have people in here uh, that have not been baptized. That's something that's a responsibility that God calls His household, His children to do. After salvation, then you make a proclamation of what God has done in your life by following through obedience and, and baptism. But as well with that, it, it shouldn't stop at baptism. It should continue on uh, through communion as we continue to proclaim that each time. And then it should continue on in, in my service and my joining a local church. Again, we have several people here who attend each and every week who have not made the commitment to join, being fitted together to work together in this local assembly for God's glory. And so we really need to consider joining this local church if you've not done so. Now, if you're new here and there's been, uh, you know, th there should be a time to where you get to learn and you get to understand and you get to see if you're on the same page. But if you've been here for some period of time, and you're not a member of this local church, my question is why? What's hindering you? Why are you not being fitted together with those around you? I think for some, it's this. I need to be humble, like Christ. Certainly that would be with whether it's baptism, and certainly that would be whether it's um, joining this church membership, but that's in carrying out the vision of this church. For us to work together, we're going to have to be humble like Christ so that we can be fitted together. So there wouldn't be music wars. So there wouldn't be aesthetic wars. So there wouldn't be uh, which ministry is the most effective type of wars. You know how much more ministry we could do in this local church if people humbled themselves like Christ 
and then were allowed, allowed Christ to fit them together for His glory, for His benefit, for the larger building that God is building uh, together. We need more people serving and not making it about them and pounding their chest and saying, this is the way that it needs to be done, but they need to be listening and hearing from Christ who's telling us how it should be done and working with one another. And so God certainly has given us much to chew on this week as we think about our status. We're all equally valuable. But then how does that play out together so that we look different from the world? Jews and Gentiles being brought together in one local church for the greater cause of God's exaltation. That's what we need happening right here, right now in our church. Then, and only then, will we, will we be a church that impresses those who are around us. Again, not for our status, not for how big our building is, but for God. He is worthy. God bless.